Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining me for today's discussion on exercise and sport nutrition. My name is Aaron and today I'm going to talk to you about important considerations in dietary uh, and nutrition habits and what to look for specifically as it relates to athletes who are trying to get the most out of their training and sports performance. I will start this discussion by saying that these are recommendations and most of them come from the uh, guidance of the National Strength and Conditioning Association, but I would still encourage you to seek the advice of a registered dietitian or a sports nutritionist to get the absolute uh, best and most specific plan for you or your athlete. Most athletes have at least one of three goals when considering their diet. They either want to increase lean muscle mass, uh, meaning skeletal muscle, decrease fat mass or make sure they are properly fueled and healthy so that they can pr perform uh, to their optimum capabilities. Generally when an athlete is working toward uh, peak sports performance, uh, they will alter their diet to either gain muscle, lose weight or body fat for their specific sport or uh, sport position. Um, and in the process, they'll work to be the absolute strongest, fastest and most, most athletic person uh, at their level. Regardless of the specific goal, energy or total energy expenditure is one of the first things to take into account when considering the athlete's nutrition plan. Total energy expenditure is the total number of calories expended throughout the day, including basal metabolic rate, thermic effect of food, and physical activity. Total energy expenditure can vary uh, from person to person based on the individual's body size, gender, body composition, genetics, and physical activity level. Now, when it comes to nutrition, the most basic information to consider is the thermic effect of food. In other words, how much energy is provided through different macronutrients. Most people know that uh, of the three macronutrients, carbohydrate and protein are going to give 4 K calories per gram, and fat gives 9 K calories per gram. Now, if you're digging into the science, you can look at the process of digesting, uh, absorbing, transporting, and storing those uh, macronutrients. And because of this, each macronutrient will produce less net usable uh, energy for the body after it is ingested compared to before it was consumed. Certain macronutrients uh, require more energy than others to be digested, absorbed, transported, and stored. All calories are not the same. And that is something to keep in mind when creating your nutrition plan, whether it's for weight gain or for weight loss. For example, if a person consumed 200 calories of extra protein every day for a year, as opposed to 200 calories of sucrose or table sugar, the results would be quite different. Uh, if an athlete's goal is to lose weight, he or she is likely to uh, lose some lean muscle mass in most cases. Uh, but by increasing the amount of protein that is ingested, the athlete will be able to preserve lean muscle mass and burn more calories because of the high thermogenic properties of protein. Uh, some sports like boxing, mixed martial arts, wrestling, gymnastics, and figure skating might require an athlete to lose some weight, whether that is to get into a certain weight class or improve body composition. In these cases, athletes will go into a hypocaloric uh, diet or energy restricted diet. This is simply where the person consumes fewer calories than what is normally necessary to maintain body weight. <clears throat> Some might go to the extreme route and follow a very low calorie diet, uh, which is designed by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute as a diet containing fewer than 800 calories per day. In this case, the diet will generally consist of mostly protein, but still meet the daily recommend, uh, recommended daily allowance for all essential vitamins and minerals. <clears throat> These diets are only used in extreme cases when a person is considered obese and are not recommended for athletes. Most athletes are already very active and can lose weight if needed by increasing their overall activity and decreasing their calories. Now, in most cases, athletes should focus first on losing fat from adipose tissue as opposed to focusing on overall weight, unless, of course, the goal is to compete in a weight class sport. If possible, the goal should be to reduce body fat during the off season as opposed to in season. This is because energy consumption will go down and that means that overall energy levels might also decrease, uh, not to mention the risk of losing strength or power. Most athletes look to lose, uh, lose weight uh, should reduce calories by about 500 calories per day or about 20% below maintenance calories and focus on reducing those calories from dietary fat. 
Now, when dietary fat is decreased, protein intake, intake should uh, be maintained or slightly increased. The recommendations are 1.8 grams to 2.7 grams per kilogram of body weight per day uh, when the goal is fat loss. Published research uh, shows that diets higher in protein most likely aid in weight loss because of the satiating and thermic effects of protein. Many people who consume a high protein diet will tend to eat less and according to research uh, will consume up to 31% fewer calories at the next meal. Now if gaining weight or lean muscle mass is the goal, the athlete needs to be on a training plan that will encourage hypertrophy and muscle gain. Uh, but also needs to keep energy balance in mind with respect to consuming more calories than are expended. To optimize lean muscle mass gain uh, while minimizing fat gain, the increased calories should uh, come predominantly from protein and carbohydrate with only minimal increases in fat consumption. The goal is to increase protein synthesis while decreasing protein breakdown. So the athlete should focus on increasing calories uh, about 10 to 15% above what is needed to maintain existing body weight. Now the calories should be spread throughout the day and as a general recommendation, carbohydrate intake should account for about 40 to 50% of daily calories uh, with approximately 30% coming from protein and 20 to 30% from fat. Getting more specific, uh, protein intake in this case should be about 1.4 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. Uh, so for a 185 pound athlete, that would be about 117 to 142 uh, grams of protein per day. <clears throat> this recommendation will allow the athlete to uh, be able to optimize muscle growth without sacrificing carbohydrate and fat so that optimal energy will be available for high intensity resistance training and adequate testosterone production in the body. Protein synthesis requires uh, the use of ATP, so an energy deficient diet may decrease protein synthesis. The most important thing to remember when considering energy balance, uh, whether the goal is to increase or decrease weight, is to be mindful of your protein intake. When attempting to lose weight, athletes and physically active people should decrease total caloric intake, uh, but keep protein intake at about 1.8 to 2.7 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. Uh, using the, exa the example of the 185 pound athlete, that would be 151 to 227 grams of protein per day. Now I know for some people that sounds like a lot, but remember the satiating effects of protein and the thermic properties that protein carries. <clears throat> Now, if the athlete is attempting to gain weight, he or she should increase calories about 15% above maintenance level, again, focusing on protein and carbohydrate intake. Monitoring energy levels is important for other reasons too. Uh, if energy levels are too low, this could lead to improper menstrual function in females and could be a cause for concern in bone health, uh, cardiovascular health, metabolism, mental health, and gastrointestinal health. When it comes to the three macronutrients, uh, the two scenarios I just laid out put a heavy emphasis on protein, and protein is very important. Uh, I'll actually talk more about that in, in a little bit, but uh, carbohydrates shouldn't be discounted. Carbs are very important for regular biological processes, uh, but also for performance. They serve as fuel for all tissues in the body. Uh, the brain, for example, uses blood uh, sugar glucose almost exclusively. Now, carbohydrate can be converted to energy at a rapid rate, so skeletal muscle relies on it uh, more and more as intensity increases during training or competition. Uh, monosaccharides, uh, specifically glucose, are especially important to athletes who train regularly because it is absorbed by the small intestine. Um, it is much more readily available to uh, working muscles as opposed to other sugars like fructose or uh, galactose. So what happens when you eat carbs? Uh, after a meal, the body stores as much carbohydrate in the form of glycogen as possible uh, while helping the body keep blood glucose levels as normal as possible. During exercise, the body increases the use of fat and carbohydrate as fuel sources. Uh, fat is the primary fuel source when at rest or during low intensity exercise, uh, but once a max level is reached at about 50% of VO2 max, carbohydrate kicks in to provide a large, uh, larger percentage of fuel to meet the energy demands. <clears throat> At the rate that glycogen is depleted, um, that depends on the intensity of the exercise or activity. 
Um, as mus muscle glycogen levels decline late into a training session or competition, uh, the body begins to rely more on blood glucose as a carbohydrate source. If more carbohydrates aren't consumed during the session, hypoglycemia or low blood sugar <clears throat> excuse me, could be triggered, uh, ultimately affecting the athlete's performance. This can also contribute to the central nervous system being fatigued. <clears throat> Fatigue during a prolonged session is typically caused uh, by depleted carbohydrate stores in working muscles. This happens regardless of having sufficient oxygen uh, supplied to the muscles and despite a nearly unlimited storage of energy from fat. <clears throat> so how much carbohydrate should you consume in preparation for a training session or competition? It's suggested to consume uh, higher levels of carbohydrate to improve overall muscle performance. Ingestion rate should mirror the intensity of the activity you're preparing uh, to participate in. So athletes who participate in a lower intensity exercise or competition, for example, might be okay with consuming three to five grams of carbs per kilogram of body weight per day, uh, while athletes who participate in moderate to high intensity activity for four to five hours, uh, for example, per day should target up to 12 uh, grams of carbs per kilogram of body weight per day. So going back again, using that example of the 185 pound athlete, uh, that would be 252 to 420 uh, grams of carbs per day for lower intensity exercise and up to 1,009 grams of carbs uh, per day for moderate to high intensity activity. Now, replenishing muscle glycogen with carbs after a training session or competition uh, is also important for recovery. Think of it as refueling and beginning the recovery process so that you're prepared to go for your next competition or training session. Uh, take the example of an athlete uh, who has a weekend tournament, maybe playing multiple games per day. Uh, glycogen must be restored as soon as possible, pr uh, preferably within a couple of hours. If not, this could mean early onset of fatigue in the next match or game. The athlete in this case should consume high glycemic carbs uh, because they've been shown to result in rapid restoration of skeletal muscle glycogen. In the case of resistance training, low glycemic carbohydrate sources are recommended as a part of everyday eating. Higher glycemic food uh, would be recommended immediately post-exercise for optimal muscle glycogen re uh, repletion and insulin response. So to prevent uh, suboptimal carb stores, um, an aerobic endurance athlete like a long distance runner or swimmer should consume about 55 to 65 percent of total caloric intake from carbs. Uh, the definite amount depends uh, and can vary from person to person. Like I mentioned, athletes participating in high levels of training uh, for more than four hours per day uh, may need 12 grams of carbs per kilogram of body weight per day. Anaerobic athletes won't need uh, as much, they'll need uh, maybe five to seven grams per kilogram of body weight per day. Although an anaerobic athlete consistently trains at high intensity, uh, the relative short duration of the intensity is lower than that of an aerobic endurance athlete. For resistance or uh, power training athletes, uh, 55 to 65 percent of total calories from carbs ensure near optimal energy. So athletes on a 3,500 uh, calorie per day diet in which 65% uh, of caloric intake is composed of carbohydrate should target about 570 grams of carbohydrate daily. Put into perspective, a non-active adult consuming 3,500 calories per day at about 55% of carbs would need fewer carbs daily. Uh, that's about 340 for a 140, uh, sorry, 154 pound person. Uh, during periods of intense physical training, most athletes can meet their carbohydrate needs with 5 to 10 grams of uh, carbs per kilogram of body weight per day. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, protein is crucial for overall health and sport performance. Uh, when protein is consumed and digested, uh, it's absorbed from the uh, small intestine into the blood as amino acids and short peptides. Uh, these amino acids are available to be used by the body directly, stored in the body in small amounts as free amino acids, or synthesized into new proteins. Proteins are constantly being created and broken down in the body. In order to benefit uh, from training adaptations, the rate of synthesis must be greater than the rate of breakdown. This happens with an appropriate level of training stress uh, combined with adequate, pro adequate protein intake. Now, when you're looking for protein uh, from food sources, 
Remember, there are complete proteins and incomplete proteins. Complete proteins are composed of animal protein and soy and contain all nine essential amino acids. Incomplete proteins are typically plant-based and do not possess uh, the full complement of essential amino acids. Uh, vegan athletes can meet the body's essential amino acid needs by consuming different protein sources that will collectively uh, have all the essential amino acids. Generally speaking, animal sources are higher in uh, total protein and have higher uh, quality protein because they contain a larger amount of essential amino acids compared to other types of protein. Now, as far as dairy protein, uh, it's a specific type of animal protein and there are two main types that you can look for, casein and whey. Now, because of their different digestive properties, whey and casein have drastically different biochemical uh, effects that athletes can take advantage of. Uh, casein is found predominantly in milk and exhibits a high quality amino acid profile. When protein is ingested, stomach acid causes it to coagulate, which results in much slower digestion and absorption. Um, now, the sustained release of amino acids in blood uh, make casein the ideal protein to take uh, before sleeping or periods of fasting. Now, whey protein is a high quality protein. It has concentrations of essential amino acids. Uh, it's easily digestible and quickly absorbed. You, you've probably seen it um, in supplement stores and might know the benefits, but aren't quite sure where it comes from. Well, whey protein is er, the unprocessed protein extracted from dairy. It contains non-protein elements like lipids and lactose. Uh, there are three common available forms of whey supplements. Uh, the first one is whey protein concentrate, uh, which is the least refined and has a final processing protein content below 90%. Whey protein isolate, um, this is more refined than whey protein uh, concentrate and has a protein content of 90% or greater, which could be important for athletes who are lactose intolerant. And whey protein uh, hydrolysate, this is the most common, but the classification is really broad. The idea behind whey protein hydrolysis uh, is that by creating new peptides through hydrolysis, the protein will be absorbed faster because it doesn't have to undergo as much dig digestion. Now, protein supplements might be uh, the most available type of supplement found in stores and on websites for con uh, convenient and quick ordering, uh, but whole foods are still more common when it comes to protein consumption. Research has identified the whole food sources uh, may have different anabolic effects compared to isolated supplements. The reason is that other ele elements in whole food may contribute to their biomechanical uh, effect on the body. For example, whole egg consumption has been shown to increase uh, muscle protein synthesis to a greater extent uh, than the consumption of an identical dose of egg white supplement. One of the most argued about topics in nutrition is protein intake. Uh, you know, am I getting enough protein in my diet? Am I getting too much? Um, is too much protein bad for me? Um, the daily recommended intake is set at 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. Now that's way too low for athletes and special considerations need to be taken into account when determining um, athlete specific protein intake like training age, current periodization phase and goals, uh, food choices and preferences, and total caloric intake. Intense peaking phases, for example, require uh, much higher protein intake than other uh, times like the off-season. Uh, there's been a misconception that there is a 20 gram limit of protein based on digestion or absorption. The 20 gram limit is actually in reference to maximal stimulation of protein synthesis. More than 20 grams of protein will not stimulate uh, protein synthesis more, but will increase ingested protein breakdown. Body weight specific uh, dose is suggested to be 0.31 grams per kilogram of body weight uh, to produce maximal stimulation of muscle protein synthesis. Daily protein dosing um, might be the most important consideration in optimizing the adaptive response to exercise. Uh, for most athletes, 1.4 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of body weight per day uh, will be an adequate amount. 
um, to account for certain circumstances like calorie restricted diets, um, a dose of up to two grams per kilogram of body weight uh, per day is suggested. Um, another quick misconception is that there's a short-lived lived, uh, metabolic window of opportunity to get your protein. Um, this actually doesn't exist. Uh, this is actually more accurate in uh, carbohydrate uh, intake. Now, unlike carbohydrate and protein, there are no firm standards on recommendations for fat intake for athletes. Acceptable uh, macronutrient distribution range for fat is 20 to 35 percent of total energy intake. When fat intake is at 30 uh, percent, dietary guidelines for Americans recommends that the portion of energy from fatty acids be at 10 percent saturated, 10 percent polyunsaturated, and 10 percent monosaturated. This needs to be planned out by the athlete because an equal balance of fat intake will simply not happen by choice. Saturated fats are um, abundant in the American diet and are found in animal fat like beef and dark meat poultry. Monosaturated fats are found in vegetable oils like olive oil and canola oil and in peanut butter. And polyunsaturated fats are found in most vegetable oils, nuts, cheese, and fish. Um, an interesting finding, though, uh, though it's based on limited research, uh, suggests that fat intake of 20% of total calories as compared to 40% of total calories had no effect on exercise training or performance. Another study, uh, this one was based in Switzerland, had participants ingest a high-fat diet or a low-fat diet for five weeks, and at the end of the five weeks, no difference was seen in the time it took the participant to run a half marathon um, or in total work output during a 20-minute all-out time trial on a uh, cycle ergometer. On the other hand, more recent data uh, points to extreme low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diets may result in loss of lean muscle mass, but at a level that doesn't affect power output and performance. Now, an obvious but sometimes forgotten aspect of sports nutrition is hydration. It sounds odd, but um, I've had sessions with junior high, high school aged athletes who make it an entire day until a 5 p.m. session without drinking any water at all. That just blows my mind. Um, but water is, is the most important nutrient in the human body and accounts for 60% of a person's body weight. Uh, it's stored in multiple places in the body like fat, bone, muscle, and blood plasma. Uh, blood, for example, is about 90% water, while skeletal muscle is 75% water. So you can see how important it is to stay hydrated, uh, especially while training or during a competition. Normal hydration is crucial for both uh, good athletic performance and cardiovascular and thermoregulatory uh, thermo function. In fact, uh, dehydration greater than 2% of body weight is the threshold for impaired aerobic uh, endurance performance. The major cause of dehydration in athletes um, is sweat losses that aren't compensated for through fluid intake. If you're thirsty, uh, that's the first sign of dehydration. And when most, most people are thirsty, uh, they're able to get a drink, even if it's during a competition or a training session. Um, some athletes, though, uh, might be at greater risk than others because of the equipment that they, they have to wear during a competition or in situations where getting a drink uh, when needed just isn't possible. Uh, just as dehydration is a concern, uh, so is uh, hyponatremia or overconsumption of hypotonic fluids. Symptoms include weight gain during exercise, disorientation, confusion, headache, nausea, vomiting, and muscle weakness. Now, another supplement that I want to talk about um, is creatine. Now, it's always recommended that athletes get their fuel and recovery from natural sources prior to relying on supplements. Uh, but in addition to protein supplements, uh, creatine is one that's actually often recommended and is possibly researched um, more than any other supplement. Now, creatine was once demonized by many and thought to be unsafe, uh, but the truth is scientific studies indicate uh, that creatine supplementation is an effective and safe nutritional strategy uh, to promote gains and strengthen lean muscle mass during resistance training. It can be consumed as a powder uh, mixed in a drink or ingested in capsule, tablet, or gummy form. Um, it's also available in foods like meat or fish um, and is synthesized in the kidneys, liver, and pancreas. 
Uh, but why should you take it? You know, what does it do? Um, the primary reason athletes might take cre creatine as a supplement is because it increases the rate of ATP regeneration, uh, which reduces fatigue during intense, repeated exercise bouts, in turn allowing more high-quality work to be performed. Um, it can also increase strength gains during training. Now, the International Society of Sports Nutrition uh, position stand on creatine states that, quote, the tremendous numbers of investigations conducted with positive results from creatine monohydrate supplementation lead us to conclude that it is the most effective nutritional supplement available today for increasing high intensity exercise capacity and building muscle mass. Uh, now, while protein and creatine are frequently used as supplements, uh, caffeine is one of the most widely used stimulants in the world. It can be found in tea, coffee, soft drinks, um, energy drinks, chocolate, and other foods. Now, when it enters the system, it acts as a stimulant to the central nervous system, uh, which causes the heart rate and blood pressure to increase. Now, while some people might think caffeine is used uh, relatively new in sports, um, it has been used in sports for more than 40 years. Uh, studies show that doses of 4 milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight can increase mental alertness and improve logical reasoning, free recall, and recognition of memory uh, tasks. It can also help increase time to exhaustion in aerobic endurance exercise bouts, decreasing ratings of perceived exertion. Uh, going back to that 185 pound athlete, uh, that would be about 336 milligrams of caffeine. Now, it should be noted, research is unclear uh, regarding caffeine and improved sports performance. Uh, this may be attributed to study design factors, but benefits have been shown though that doses ranging from three to nine milligrams per kilogram of body weight um, are, can be beneficial. The performance effects are usually evident when caffeine is consumed within 60 minutes prior to exercise. Um, that's a pretty high dosage. Uh, that range is actually 250 to 756 milligrams of caffeine. Now, one misconception about caffeine is that it has been long thought to act as a diuretic. Uh, recent research, however, has shown no evidence of dehydration with moderate regular uh, daily caffeine intake in the form of coffee. As an example of how widely it's been accepted, uh, caffeine is actually permitted uh, for use by the International Olympic Committee. Uh, the NCAA, on the other hand, has restricted caffeine in higher doses. Uh, there are many more supplements that have been researched, some with positive results and others uh, inconclusive. If you choose to use a supplement, make sure to investigate uh, what is included in the supplement, what side effects it may have, and if it will truly have positive benefits to your training. Now, while I was able to provide you with a lot of information today about nutrition as it relates to exercise and sports performance, uh, this is only a snapshot of the deeper topic of sports nutrition. This is truly an interesting topic and one that uh, can help many athletes take the next step in their athletic performance. If you're interested in getting uh, detailed and specific uh, advice about a full nutrition plan, Again, I encourage you to seek the input of a sports nutritionist or a dietitian. Uh, there are other resources you can check out on your own that will pr provide a wealth of information, including NSCA's Guide to Sport and Exercise Nutrition and Nancy Clark's Guidebook to Sport Nutrition. So check those out, read from multiple sources, um, and don't forget the nutrition component when establishing your full sports uh, performance program. Thanks again for joining me today, and until next time, be well.